evening, everybody, and thank you very much, particularly thank you very much, our Excellency Ambassador Balzaretti and uh, Dr. Daniel Roth to have invited us uh, to be here this evening, to have an exchange, and uh, what we actually would like to do is a little bit bring in, not just Ebola as a topic, where because we have listened to that many times, and it's also to see a little bit how and it was this focus from our Swiss side, what is the engagement, but also in the international level and in the networks we operate, to really uh, do this fight against this, uh, this epidemic. Some of my dear colleagues I see here, they said, I mean, this is just an agglutination of these malaria people that are suddenly doing all Ebola. And so you will wonder what is going to happen. Do, don't they have enough work anymore uh, with, with, with malaria? No, no, it's not the case. But I think it's very important to know that every minute we speak here, one person is still dying of, uh, of malaria. And we have 9,000 deaths of, of Ebola. I think the perspectives need to be kept in place. And what we learn out of a, a disease which is not in this epidemic dimension of malaria in terms of what we would like to bring you close, uh, uh, is something that has a high relevance in the field uh, of this Ebola fight at the moment. And I think this is what we would like to sh uh, show you. It's not all about vi uh, vaccines. It's also about the overall context on how we have to see uh, these, uh, these interventions in, uh, in, in, in the field of Ebola. So it's a little bit my task now, before we go into this specific 120 volunteers and all these things, it's to really to look at uh, what are the other contextual issues and what are actually sometimes long-term contributions in science, not only they are coming from our groups, but coming from many also of European efforts that have been maybe even underestimated. So we talk about Ebola, the killer virus, you remember this uh, Newsweek, and here people nearly forgot that there are many other burdens that these countries face. And this was all focused on, on Ebola, the, the big thing, and nobody actually was in this issue of the Newsweek really focusing on the fact that with the fact that you have Ebola in a country, health systems stopped to operate. And you had actually no case of malaria was very well attended anymore. No complicated pregnancy was very well looked after it. The peripheral health services were just shut down. This is the context, not only the focus that, for instance, such a newspaper has. I know that you should know, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's, so, it's, it's something to recall which is very relevant in terms of science efforts that we go back to this fascinating cycle. I always say the whole thing is totally fascinating in biology, that you have a virus that is sitting in the fruit bats or in bats, and that you actually, the bats are very happy, not infected, and you actually, all other animals basically get infected and get sick, also man, and we don't go into details of all these routes of transmission, but these zoonotic cycles that of zoonotic diseases that are ac where animals are the reservoir and whenever man enters into the cycle of a zoonotic cycle, you have a so-called emerging or re-emerging diseases is something which on the science side, if you want to go to science, has to do with bringing the concept of one health, bringing human and veterinary medicine together. Not here a little bit of veterinary medicine and there a little bit of human medicine, but understanding these cycles in order to understand what the true risks are. This is what we learn out of Ebola as well, is that we actually must much more emphasize on this One Health concept, because it's not the only virus around. If you think of a fact that on communicable diseases, there are 1,300 approximate communicable diseases and 800 are zoonotic in nature. And that's just one example. So this is one thing which I wanted to remind you. And of course, it has to do the distribution of all these old epidemics. Here on one side, you see the African map with all the epidemics, the foci we had. And on the other side, you see the African map of the, of the bats, where the bats are distributed. In the middle, you have the bats and all those you have seen 
Again, this is fantastic, actually, to see these fruit bats, particularly in the evening when they fly home to their trees. So it's only frustrating if you are in, in public health, all these issues. So you see, that was the situation before we had this severe crisis that started in December 2013. And we knew Ebola, that this can happen. These are these red and green and blue dots here. And this is the different outbreaks, the different strains. I don't want to go into that one. But always these were very few cases, sometimes 350 deaths, 450 deaths. The Uganda outbreak is more cases. The size of these uh, cakes are the size of the cases. Could always be uh, re contained. So if somebody, we were asked by journalists, why did nobody invest in any of these vaccines and any better measures of, uh, on Ebola? Uh, this was in September when the state of emergency was declared. But I would say all of us in front of all the health problems we have in Africa, the burden we have, we would have sat together one year ago, or a little bit more than one year ago. None of you would have any invested in, in Ebola because you said, no, no, you know, these are small outbreaks. We know it's, there, it's difficult, but they can be contained. We don't need to invest uh, half a billion in order to develop a vaccine in given such a situation. We have much higher priorities. Let's say malaria. Let's say the, the multidrug resistant tuberculosis and HIV and, and, and. So the question is here. I mean, this is the roots of transmission question. If you have it in the pot or if the hunting or if it's the direct contamination. Here we could discuss long about it. But I want just to... As a summary of the summary, the previous outbreaks they had low population density, low population mobility and dynamics. You know, if you go to these places, to Kikwit, for instance, one is a classical outbreak in Congo, hey, you are very remote. You don't travel far. And you had more or less functioning health services. Nowadays, what we have faced in the situation of West Africa is a totally different situation that we have high population density, high population mobility, and dynamics. If you look at the situation in terms also of ethnic groups, how they trade among each other in northern Liberia in, uh, and, and in Guinea, this is all a very dynamic, vibrant tissue. And you have totally dysfunct peripheral health services. And this actually explains some of the things uh, that, we, that we see. So that's why we end up with this one. This is only 16th of January data, but our ambassador has already summarized some of these points with the hotspots on the, on the orange points uh, being the ones of 20 days ago, the cases, and you, you know this area. You have seen these maps. Now, if you really know, uh, also look at it more detail, you know that uh, we have the course of the epidemic is a little bit different. If you have now here the number of cases, these are the WHO data which we can gratefully use. If you look at these curves, you see in West Africa and Liberia and in Sierra Leone very clearly classical epidemic, cur uh, epidemic curves. But look at the Guinea ones, these are different. They go up and then they go, they oscillate at, at a certain level. It's a different situation. I will get back to that one. That could mean that you have different pots where it plop pops up again and where you actually create an epidemic. While here you have more of a, a care, maybe not so careful situation in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, more of a point source epidemic picture than uh, compared to Guinea. So it's a different course, a different dynamics. You also know, and this was said by our ambassador as well, that uh, here you have the incidence, the number of new cases. And that's what you saw from before. In Guinea, this whole thing lingers on, in a way, while in Liberia, some of the teams from the vaccine trial, I just jump a little bit, came back last week to London and said, ah, we have just been there, we don't have enough cases to do our trial. I mean, that is a, a good thing of uh, one side, but it's, it's very interesting because you see it's tailing off. In Sierra Leone, it's a similar picture as in Liberia, more similar to Liberia. And the other thing which is to retain when we think about measures, about interventions, you should not forget 
Here, if you look at the case fatality rate, you see a situation by which overall you have a slight decrease. In Guinea, you have nearly no effect. Case fatality means those who are infected, cases who die. And if you have in Liberia, you have a clear reduction. It's a strange situation here at the end. And in Sierra Leone, it's most expressed that you really have a decrease. And the question is, why is this decrease? There's no drug. There is no vaccine. That was really system strengthening, render operational the system again, as well as that around 70% of the cases are treated under safe uh, facilities, as in, in good dedicated treatment centers or units or whatever it is called, as well as you pay a lot of attention to the handling of dead bodies, the funerals, and all these issues. So you see, this is the situation, and I just want to remind at that stage, when I, before I go on now, what is the science behind, and was, was asked by Daniel Roth to talk about the, what do we do in our country on that. Remember, the big three of the neglected tropical diseases are malaria, uh, TB, and, and HIV AIDS. And these are expressed here as TALIS, these are the disability adjusted life years that many you, you, you know. It's just the millions of healthy years of life you lose. And then you have all these neglected tropical diseases, where some of you don't know every, uh, all the diseases. It's the wormy world, and it's the sleeping sickness, and so on. But you don't find these, these viruses. You don't find them. And if you add up all the yellow, it gets red. It's number two, even without the, these virus. So you see, this is what I tried to say at the beginning. It's the priority question. I mean, Ebola in context and the context of Ebola, that's the issue that we have to address now. So what is the Swiss science and contributions and partnerships? As our ambassador said, it's the humanitarian aid that is important. And the humanitarian aid not just as helping, but I mean, we have used some of the actions which are used as an operational research in system strengthening. So it is not just to try to ship something for A to B, but really in be involved also in an emergency aid situation to have a concentrated also science-based approach of system strengthening. The tools, we will hear about it. We have the vaccines, the talks to follow, but also that in Switzerland based, the product development partnership like, PA, like FIND is involved in the diagnostics uh, network where many scientists from outside and inside our country work. But the important thing that we have here is actually the systems preparedness issue, which is often forgotten when you talk about what can science do, what should science do. It's the systems preparedness and the surveys, as well as the One Health approach to bringing the understanding of zoonotic diseases uh, together with the understanding of public health and global health in this way. And we were sensitized very early, and that's a little bit of personal history. 20 years ago, exactly, or 21 years ago, we had in the Thai National Park, Thai Park in West Africa, at the border between Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia, there was a long-term Swiss project on following up, and it's now the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, on, on the chimpanzee. And then suddenly this chimpanzee died. And, the, uh, and out of a colony of 46, 11 chimpanzees died within short periods. And so the veterinarians, they rushed in and started to dissect this chimpanzee and so on. And they all said, ah, this is, see, see, this is measles. People around the park bring in measles, and the chimpanzee dies. So the model that you know from colonialism, the Spanish bringing measles to Latin America, it's another issue. So everybody thought it's fine, until one of our veterinarians got sick. This was actually the first case of Ebola we had 20 years ago in Basel. In, and we, it was medivaced to Switzerland, and I think we understood there a little bit this, this potential that is resting in this forest, but also in this region of West Africa, where we had 20 years later the misery that we are uh, discussing now. So the, the summary of where we could talk about each of the fields is really this, the basic biomedical work to the translational 
and the system science work. So we are talking about tools, you see, to have the right tools. The introduction now to the vaccines. So this man certainly doesn't have the right tool to knock down this tree. And we want to do it better for Ebola. So it's the vaccines, and I think here uh, the work that we do in diagnostics, the, the crisis to development work, I think this is would be something which we can see in parallel to the, to the, uh, to the tools development. And the particular thing which we would like to see out is uh, the surveillance work, as well as the tailoring of the system strengthening to the local system. The Guinea Health System and the Liberian one and the uh, Sierra Leone one, they are totally different not in, in some of the structures and functions. And you need to tailor these approaches in order to be effective. As I was asked to say something of who is involved in Switzerland, in the European networks and so on, it is actually all the federal universities are involved, our institution, but also the Federal Office of Health liaises clearly to us, we as a Swiss TPH, as, a na interna uh, as the National Reference Center, but also the Swiss Development Corporation and the Humanitarian Aid, but also the private sector. So I see this, and this was, if you can say, a little bit fostered also through the work, the long-term work we did on malaria. It is these networks that started to play and take up uh, the challenge uh, to work uh, uh, together. Some of these uh, issues on the science illustrated. This is the famous curve, you know, and with the missed opportunity in Ebola, because what is the take home message here? It's not to see how oh, it gets worse and worse. The first cases we had in December 2013. But my point is that we had people, and Blaise Chantons, one of the PhD students, was actually in Guinea. Uh, and, uh, and was doing malaria work that discovered that something goes wrong. And Médecins Sans Frontières was already saying in March, April, that there is an unusual pattern of this disease going to happen. The consequence was of our international community, it's not blaming anyone specifically, is the fact that at that time we didn't listen to those who were at the periphery. Because those who really saw the case, it, it took ages until we really built up the case to make a, a, um, uh, the, 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 the real step forwards to the global emergency, etc. What is the take-home message? And that has stimulated a lot of, uh, of research on surveillance and on health information systems. Not only to do just collect data, 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 but really have an eye for surveillance to be alert. And this is the science context of surveillance response. What are the minimal essential data in space and time we need to capture what is happening? And that is, uh, that is actually something which Ebola brought to us, that we are much more sensitive to do that. Do you know that uh, the protective clothes and, uh, and all the, the issue, this picture is just here to actually come to the health workers' infections. I mean, he, here it shows you uh, the um, how many health workers have been infected. And then some people have said, yeah, you know, these, these protective clothes don't help. All of you have stuck once into these protective clothes, and you know how difficult it is to work under these conditions. A small, tiny mistake you make by changing your uh, gloves and, and so on, you can actually be at risk. So the issue is not so much actually to, to discuss how much they work, but it, I, it, it's actually how to rebuild the health services. Motivation at the, at the level were actually are very important. It will come back with the whole strategy of vaccine testing, that you go to the health personnel first, not only the doctor and the nurses, but the drivers and the, the cleaners as well, so that you render operational the, the health systems anymore. So this is... You think it's simple, but uh, one of the key problems was that you reopen the closed health centers by paying the salary first, that's motivation. Secondly, give protective clothes to the people. So you cannot just say, just go to the periphery and start working again. But you really need to have these basics. And where we actually learned in terms of logistics is really to get much more effectively reopened these um, 
these, uh, these peripheral health services. Not to have these facilities as they have in, in Geneva, but really just to get uh, the whole system going again. A little bit on numbers again. Have a look at this Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And green are the suspected cases. And blue is confirmed. That's what, what you find out with all these numbers is in Guinea, you have hardly any suspected cases. So the question is not to say, is this another virus and what is happening? This is actually the way how this surveillance system and diagnosis is made that you would ask to question. So very clearly when you see such a graph, of course you are shocked. And the second moment is actually, it prompts you to insist in really uh, standardizing and in training the people in order to really making this diagnosis in a, in a correct way. And that's here where the issue comes, where not only the diagnostic test helps, but it's the diagnostic test compare, uh, combined with the strengthened health system. And it is actually what I say, that your surveillance response system with people and the data and maybe the di di diagnostic tool helps you to restart uh, actually your systems again. That's what we have learned. And of course, here in Brussels, you cannot show that it has worked, but we could take you to show how these approaches, science-based, have really led to some of the decreases or have contributed to the decreases you have seen. So we retain surveillance response. This is not only important for Ebola, but for all these infectious diseases and tropical diseases where we would like to detect if they re-emerge or if actually, or where we would actually like to eliminate and we want to find the, the pockets of transmission. Our spirit should go away, and that's maybe provocative for some people here. You should forget about monitoring and evaluation. Because monitoring and evaluation is completely, that's what we learn, is hunter-gatherer operation. You collect what you can collect, left, right, and center. If we are really wanting to care for systems, the scientific spirit and the operational spirit must be surveillance response. Minimally essential data in space and time to capture events. Not maximally possible gigabytes accumulated in the global fund in Geneva or I don't know God knows where. This is not the way for. And I think this is this health starting the health systems again, uh, a, a, a graph that we have from Gavi is really to say, you see these countries, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, had in 2013 a very good vaccination coverage. And this vaccination coverage dropped down to very lousy levels, all under 50% in this one period, this one year of, 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 of Ebola crisis. It shows you this other impact in a very dramatic way. And it and shows you also that the system strengthening effort behind, besides having a new vaccine is absolutely crucial. That's the last one now. Many of you here, do you know that I cannot have a talk without this graph? Because you see the point is this one. If you have a vaccine and if the vaccine is 80% efficacious, you have to actually assure that you have access you have the compliance of the provider, the consumer adherence, all have to comply. And if this is not 100%, and here are some figures, you can make your own examples, you end up with a great vaccine of 80%. At the level of the communities, you have 30% only. Your effectiveness is 30%. And if you do it only with those people who are close to you and you don't look for the most neglected, you're also bad in equity effectiveness because you, you forget the 70% may be the most neglected people. I give you this along, not to make the point also of the system strengthness, but to really ask for the question of effectiveness and to critically leave you, when we get the data on the efficacy of a tool, we always have to see what does this tool do when we carry it to our communities. So this is the Ebola situation with not let's very sophisticated, but with very strict measures. You see we are happy it goes down. And the, 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 the learning experience is, is the keeping health systems functioning in the periphery. So it's the staff motivation, and all, the surveillance systems, a big issue. So we learn 
unfortunately very late, but also hopefully for many other and other re-emerging diseases, we learn that. We learn about the One Health approaches. We know about the information and communication issues. I mean, this had to do with army should what should the army do and what should the local people do. This is a big issue. I don't go into that one. We can just the, 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 uh, discuss this at another instance. And finally, it's not against what will come now. Drugs and vaccines will help a lot, and R and D must be must be accelerated. But at the moment, this is not. Uh, we should not lose the focus on this priority. We still have a lot to do with the good results we have in strengthening these systems with the available tools, assure that we can actually contain as we want it. So this is my thank you with our friend who says don't give up. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I will directly hand over to Blaise Janton, who will go on now with the vaccine, I think. Thank you very much, Marcel. Um, I am Daniel Rod. I'm the uh, Science and Technology Councillor here, and um, I, I mean, just a few words on 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 Blaise Janton. He's actually here with a, a number of hats here tonight, and it's it's actually fascinating for us. He's, uh, yeah, well, a mic as well. <laughs> but um, I mean, he's uh, head of a travel clinic. He is in the field. He has been extensively in the field of, as well in, in Africa, but he is now coordinating mainly, and that's why we are very grateful you are here, the trial in uh, Lausanne on 120 uh, patients. So we look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Good evening, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be in Brussels without snow. We have a lot of snow here. Uh, when Daniel asked us to give uh, a title, uh, I gave it this title, Ebola vaccine, a model of partnership. And uh, then about 20 minutes later, Vazi sent her uh, a title saying something like Ebola uh, partnership uh, strengthening or whatever. And I said, oh, that's weird. We have the same title. And I, I, we, we thought that we would partially uh, uh, keep them, probably because it's very true. And really, what I will show you is is something that it's a team that has been doing that, and not only in Lausanne, but uh, everywhere in the world. So here is a small child, Papua New Guinean child, who is not having Ebola, because he, there is no uh, uh, Ebola in Papua New Guinea, but he has malaria, and he has severe malaria. So why do I put this? It's to say that malaria is, a, is very important, but it's also to say that this is the reason why uh, we were asked by WHO to uh, do this trial in Lausanne. Everybody says, why? Why you? Uh, they're saying, uh, it's weird. Uh, Switzerland, there's something for Ebola. And uh, actually, we have been working with Vazi uh, for a long time on malaria and the development of malaria vaccine. And so we have done quite a number of studies together both in Switzerland, but also in Tanzania, Papua New Guinea, and elsewhere in Africa. And the, the WHO knew that actually we were accustomed to that, and we were able, able to do this in partnership because the ultimate goal was really to go to uh, Africa. So that's the reason why we have been involved in that. It is not because we are Ebola Porsche. So how to do better? I say better because you have seen from uh, the guru's talk that uh, uh, what really worked is to have protective measures and to have health system organized. And so vaccines should be always seen as a complementary measure and not the magic bullet. And nobody here would think that a uh, vaccine will be the only response to the next Ebola epidemic. So uh, you may know that there are two leading uh, vaccine candidates, one from uh, the United States, from the Vaccine Research Institute at NIH, and this is what is called the Chimpadeno Ebola virus. I will talk about more there. And there is the other vaccine that is the vesicular uh, stomatitis virus um, vaccine that has been developed by Newlink in Canada and then uh, recently bought by uh, Merck. And this is the study that happened in, in Geneva. First partnership is there. Really, Lausanne and Geneva with WHO, we have been designing our protocol absolutely uh, in full transparency because we wanted to know, to be able to compare the two trials 
and it's not very u usual to do that, especially when you have different pharmaceutical companies that are behind, but that's really what happened. And uh, I think also for the future, we will present the data that, and we will be able really to say, this is what you can get with this vaccine or with the other vaccine. So both vaccine and all vaccines almost of Ebola uh, use the same target. You know that we don't uh, inject the Ebola virus, as you may know, but something. That's why the reason why I say, how can volunteers can come to your uh, uh, trials to, to, to be injected the Ebola vaccine? No, we are injecting a protein. So this is the Ebola virus. It's a filovirus. And you can see here surface protein. And as it is usually done in, uh, in vaccine development, you use this surface protein because this one, the glycoprotein of Ebola, is the protein that helps the virus to go into the cell and then to be able to multiply. So the whole idea is that if you develop a vaccine and you have like antibodies, you have responses with antibodies that do a hat around this protein, then this protein cannot go in the virus can go in and cannot multiply. This is the, the whole idea behind. So how this is done, here is uh, the, the, the genome of the virus here. And you have seven genes. And one gene is the gene for the glycoprotein. So that is the one that has been extracted, if you want, from the virus. And it has been integrated into this chimpanzee adenovirus. Why a chimpanzee? Because uh, we are not used to uh, the viruses of chimpanzee as humans, so you will do a good response to that. And that helps actually to generate good response, because if you go give only the protein here, you will not really have a good response. So we integrated this in the, the, the genome of the adenovirus. And at the same time, we have deleted the genes that are responsible for multiplication of the virus. So you have something that doesn't multiply in the body, but that can integrate the protein of others. And that's probably one of the m most important difference between our vaccine and the Canadian vaccine, the VSV vaccine, because this VSV, it hasn't been, uh, the, the gene of multiplication has, hasn't been deleted, so it multiply a bit. And uh, we don't know exactly how much time it multiplies in the body. Uh, and so this may generate better responses, maybe more durable, but it's more a question mark when you give this to immunocompromised patients, uh, HIV positive, as you can have in Africa. So that's the issue. The safety of all these vaccines is important. But what, what is known in terms of the chimpa, they know the nice things, and that's the reason also why we, I chose this vaccine in a way that it has been already tested, and uh, uh, Vazi tested it in, in, uh, in Kenya. It has been tested in more than 1,300 people. So we had some safety because it was used for uh, malaria vaccine candidates. So I was reasonably uh, uh, less worried, if you say. So all these vaccines, they have shown very good preclinical data. So this is, like we say, promising results. It's not always, you, s you always see promising results, but these ones were promising because when these monkeys, macaque, were injected the vaccine and then they were given the virus after 15 days, you can see all survived, although all those who didn't get the vaccine, they all died. So. All these vaccines, it's the same. I give the example of, of, of the chimpadenovirus. You can see if you give 10 to the t 11 variant or 10 to the 10 variant of this chimpadeno 3, all survive. If you give less, they do not survive. So you have to have a certain dose for uh, this vaccine to work. And if you use other adenovirus, chimpadenovirus, it may not work very well. So we chose in Lausanne to take this because we thought that this might be good in humans because uh, uh, macaques are not so far from humans or humans are not far so far from macaque. So there has been these two leading vaccine candidates are in clinical trials. You know, you have read that, but I just, for you to know that for the chimpa, they know there has been 20 people already injected in uh, the US, 60 in Oxford, 
uh, and this they started in September. Mali started in October in 80 people and we vaccinated 120. So it is uh, the same vaccine and the whole idea was to have enough safety data so it's not one trial that gives the safety data, it's all the trials that give enough safety data and then you can go to Africa. For the VSV vaccine it's exactly the same, you can see although it started a bit later so the, the, the results are, are a bit delayed and you can see this number 13, uh, 16 in the US, uh, 20 in Germany, 16 in Gabon, 14 in Kenya and 100 uh, in uh, Geneva. So that's uh, the status for now. There is a third vaccine that is in clinical trial. Uh, it's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and uh, it's uh, also an, an adenovirus but it's an adenovirus from humans, a rare adenovirus, and it's the same type of what we are doing, except that they give a second injection, what we call a boosting, hoping that the result may be better. I put this picture here because it's the boss of Bazi. She is Marie Polkini. I, I wanted to pay a tribute to her because really she has been working so hard. And when I hear a lot of criticism about WHO, everybody can be criticized, but really she has worked intensively to have drugs and vaccine available for this epidemic and she worked the day and night and uh, uh, so I think she is really to be to be thanked for that. The landscape, this is the landscape for the uh, Ebola vaccine. You can see that there are uh, about 15 Ebola vaccine that are uh, in, in, in development. There is a Chinese also uh, Ebola vaccine that has even been tried in humans. If but the real leading candidate is the one, the Chimpadeno from GSK and the, 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 the VSV that has gone into phase one uh, already in, in more than one, 200 uh, people and that are ready for the phase two. So now just some uh, news about uh, uh, our vaccine. It is the SHUV uh, where I work uh, in, uh, and uh, the, the study is a, is a randomized double blind so we don't know which dose we give uh, I will explain you that and it's a phase one a phase one is to test the safety so the vaccine doesn't harm and the immunogenic immunogenicity does it make something does it give some responses so the primary ob objective is really to know if we can give it to a lot of people in Africa so it's what we call the safety so we look at adverse events and the secondary objective is the immunogenicity. If the vaccine does something, give some responses that we had in the monkeys. So just the timeline, just it is to tell you the partnership is there, my dears, because it's really where, where all things happen. It all started by a, a phone call from Bazi on the 1st of uh, uh, September saying, uh, would you agree to do uh, a phase one very quickly of Ebola vaccine in 120 subjects? And uh, I said, uh, I don't know, I just ring you back in 20 minutes. So 20 minutes after, I, I just called our director if he was ready uh, to embark on that and my, my colleague immunologist and uh, uh, a, a clinician that was just in my office at that time. And then I, I told, this is okay. So in three weeks, we actually developed the protocol and submitted it to the ethical committee. Just this is in three and a half weeks. Usually it takes one year. If we have one year, it's good. Then we have done a lot of different things. And this was thanks to, for example, the Oxford group that gave us their protocol so we could go much quicker. This is the partnership, full transparency. The VRC in the US, the same, really. The, and so we had taken uh, uh, also uh, contacts with uh, Swiss Medic, our regulatory authorities, where we went really at, at the second or third day with all the dossier that we had saying, that's what we, we need your response very quickly, because, you know, sometimes Swiss people are quite slow, especially on the French part. Les vaudois sont très lents. Okay, final approval, you see in about three weeks again, first of subject uh, screen after, after one and a half months. We screened them before having the final approval from Swiss Medic and then we could inject them on the just uh, three, two months after uh, the first call we could first uh, uh, vaccinate uh, the, the first subject and we finished to vaccinate 120 subjects. You have to imagine that at one 
particular day, we had like 58 subjects at the same time because some were screened, some were vaccinated, some were staying at day one, day seven, day 14, day 28. You realize this. And really, they did uh, such a, a big job. So really, it's my uh, reverence to all these people. And so on the 15th of uh, uh, January, we had all safety results up to day 28 available for WHO, GSK decide on uh, uh, the f if they could go to Africa and with which dose they could go, because we used two doses. Uh, I will show you just afterwards. And uh, just uh, by, by uh, no, um, Friday, we will have all immunology results available. So really, I think that's incredible for us, <laughs> at least. So this is really uh, uh, Olga DeSantis who did all the work and really she has to be saying this was the first subject, the WHO guy that was deployed just uh, 10 days after vaccinations to uh, uh, Liberia. This is the type of blood that they uh, are taken every uh, two or three days. And uh, this is the first vaccination. So how did we do that? We screened uh, about 160 volunteers and we in, in uh, included 120, and these were potentially deployed people from MSF, uh, MEDER, WHO going in the field. So these were randomized into a low dose group and a high dose group. There were not so many people, and these are all the non-deployed volunteers, medical students. But everybody, I mean, we had an incredible turn up. Everybody was saying, "How can you have 120 subjects?" And I was saying, yeah, yeah, "I don't know." But a lot of people wanted to send a, a syringe in, in Sierra Leone, and I said, "If you want to do something, basically you can do a trial if you want to help these people." And that really was incredible. After a press conference, we had 370 uh, phone calls. Really incredible. Everybody was really had the same momentum. So, and these are the non deployed so low dose 42, high dose 40, and placebo 20. This is just, the placebo are taken just to know what is the background of headache, uh, fever, etc. You see, to be able really to know if this was due to the vaccine or not. So these are the safety results. This uh, is uh, partially uh, uh, communicated, at least it is communicated to people that will do the trial in Africa. So. 75% had local reaction. This is what you get with uh, usual vaccine, uh, routine vaccinations. But what we got is more systemic adverse events. Systemic is general symptom like headache, fatigue, uh, muscular articular pains, and fever. So this vaccine uh, basically is more reactogenic than the one that you, you, you can have. I was quite happy because when you see a vaccine that people say, oh, it does mean nothing. I said always, oof. I'm not very, these guys, were, I have high fever, I was saying, oh gosh, this is good. Although that when you have a vaccine that uh, gives fever and you give to health workers in Liberia or Guinea, this becomes a problem and that is an issue that we can discuss later. Muscular articular pains, I say this, 38% had this type of pains. Uh, this is very different of what they got in Geneva. Probably you know that that study had to be suspended for a while because there were some particular um, uh, pains in the in the toes and and uh, fingers. Then the study has been has resumed, but with a lower dose. The immunology results. I don't uh, show you exactly all the data. They are almost available, but it's still uh, in in circulating among <laughs> the, the the even more important people than you are for the people in the field, but basically the vaccine induced immune responses, and these are comparable to what has been published, although a bit higher because uh, it's a monovalent, but the US had a bivalent vaccine, meaning that there are two strains, we have only one strain, and usually the response is a bit better. What we get in terms of antibody response is a bit lower to what we get in the monkeys, but it is not so far. So really now, this vaccine has to be tested to know if what we get is sufficient or if we will need probably a boosting or something else. So all this actually was pre-financed by our hospital, but at the same time, there was all this work that has been done by, by people, including the GSK people that really, uh, thanks to, your <laughs> to the European Commission that did this call very quickly. And this, again, was incredibly short. We did this 
Rosa 2020, uh, you know, proposal in uh, seven days, usually take uh, six months, etc. It's the same, I mean, and you worked and in, in uh, two and a half weeks we, you gave uh, us the answer. And uh, so we could retroactively actually uh, finance part of the problem and this was really uh, led by, by the, the, some of the GSK people, including Rip Balu, that uh, is maybe in the audience. But uh. So, just one word now on the clinical development plan, because that's what people are uh, at now. Basically, we have finished the phase one, at least for the Chimpadeno. The vaccine is safe. We can go to Africa. How? It will be, again, doing a safety study in more people, 300 uh, 3,600, including children. You know, children are always left apart. Now they are taken very early, and this will be done in five neighboring countries of the of the countries that are affected. Not, it's done in Ghana, Mali, Nigeria, Cameroon, and uh, I don't remember the last one. And uh, so, at the same time, which is unusual, they do the efficacy studies, the, 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 so usually you do sequentially, you know, you increase your safety data and then you do, but this now, th they do the efficacy because we need to know early enough uh, when there are enough cases. So there were a lot of issues around placebo, you know, the placebo is those who di don't receive the vaccine and some uh, people were arguing that everybody should get uh, the vaccine, but imagine giving a vaccine that you don't know if it's safe and you don't know if it works, to thousands of people, this is not what you have to do. So you have to find other ways. And I just show you the other ways. One way is doing historical controls. But this doesn't work when you have an epidemic. You see, now it's, it was the epidemic like that. You introduce your vaccine here, the epidemic goes down. You say, oh, I have a beautiful vaccine. No, it's just what we observe now without vaccine. So it is not possible to do that. So we do what we call randomized control trials, so where you some get the vaccine, some get another vaccine or something uh, else. And the whole idea was in Liberia was because it, it is, but it will maybe still be done, but it's all discussed today. You are always late with Ebola, you know, you are always one day afterwards and things have changed already. So the idea was to have two different arms with two different vaccine and one group of placebo. So you reduce the placebo. This is working if you have high incidence, if you have a lot of cases and after like 300 cases you stop and you see how the people are distributed, if you have no Ebola disease in the vaccinees and all in the placebo, that means that your vaccine works, you see. But uh, this might be different. The, the other possibility people like better because it's less the issue of placebo, although you still choose which area will start first to be vaccinated. So you have a number of different areas and you vaccinate them sequentially, one after the other. So every uh, unit will be for a while a control and for a while a vaccinees and you see if the vaccinees leads to uh, those in this part have less episode than those that are in this part. This, was, this is what is planned in Sierra Leone. The discussion is about the vaccine that will be used, but this has to be decided very shortly or maybe it has been decided already. The last possibility, and I think it is probably the most promising, is what we go to do a randomized placebo control trial, but using ring vaccination. So once you have one case, uh, you go in this area and you vaccinate all the people around because they are more likely to get the disease. So you are more likely to get the response uh, early. And you randomize, either they get the vaccine, either they get another vaccine, or a placebo, and then you will have a response quite quickly. And this is what they want to do in Guinea. And what is nice, I would say nice, is that in Guinea, you, you have one focus and it goes, and another focus and it goes. So actually you can really uh, decide where you go and it might be the design that is the best also because it, il it is like that, that the vaccine will be used in epidemics when they will occur in the future. When you have one epidemic that starts, you come with your people from WHO and all the people, and then you do all your protective measures, but you add a vaccine in the village and probably in the sur surrounding village, like 50,000 or 100,000, and stop. And that should work. That is the whole idea. So all this has been uh, 
been possible because really the European Commission made uh, a major commitment and I just wanted to, to say uh, thank you. It's not because I'm here, but really it, it's the way that we were able to work and I'm very grateful to have been able to do and to, to have myself say, I think it's possible. And I always thought, people say, you have no funding, why do you do that? I said, if in Switzerland we cannot get the funding for that, I bet I really, I change the country. That's what I thought. So, together, partnership, I think uh, uh, everybody, this is a, a, a field worker, say we will win. And I think it's very important, but keeping in mind that while we were talking about 9,000 deaths uh, with Ebola, at the same time, half a million children died of malaria and 900,000 of pneumonia. So, all this work is not lost anyway if the epidemic of Ebola has gone before we can vaccinate the people because all these technologies, all this vaccine development, they can be used for malaria. They have been used for malaria. We have more data now. They can be used for HIV and other diseases. So thank you very much. And I will give the, the mic to my colleague uh, Vazi. Thank you. <laughs>